everyone. I'm Dr. Rita Roy, CEO of the National Spine Health Foundation. We're here to improve spinal health care for everyone. We do this through Spine Talks, where we bring unparalleled access to world-class experts like these doctors who are with me on the panel today. Our panel is going to be moderated by Dr. Tom Schuler, Chairman of our Medical and Scientific Board. Tom? Thank you, Rita. You know, it's so exciting to be here in San Diego to learn about neck problems. We're here to talk to you about the cervical spine, which is the neck region. And we're talking to the experts who are the ones that run the Cervical Spine Research Society. So the society that actually deals with how to advance this field of healthcare. We're blessed to have doctors from across the country. We've got Dr. Todd Albert from New York City. We have Dr. Wong from LA. We have uh, Dr. Vaccaro from Philadelphia. We have Dr. Sasso from Indianapolis. And we have Dr. Harrop from Philadelphia. So we're so excited to get into the concept and we're gonna start and and Todd, I'm going to start with you. Just let's help the uh, public understand what is the structure of the neck. We're going to talk about neck problems, but let's just talk a little bit about the anatomy. So can we describe what the essential anatomy is that they need to understand in, sure. in neck problems? Thanks, Tom. What we call the cervical spine is the neck. There's seven vertebrae, and they're bones that house a very important piece of real estate, your spinal cord. Your spinal cord comes out of your brain at the top of your neck, of the cervical spine, and at each level, different nerves come out that control your arms, your hands, and your function that your upper extremities do. The spinal cord, which is housed in the middle, controls everything. All your motions in your leg, your strength, your balance, your bowel and bladder function, basically everything. So it is the central highway connecting your brain to the rest of your body. Uh, Jim, can you talk a little bit about um, when people have neck pain, when they come in and they're talking about neck pain, what, what's causing that pain? Multiple things can cause neck pain. When we see our patients, we have to step back and we ask ourselves, what is driving this? We can have muscles, ligaments. A lot of people have poor posture, then they'll get spasms in their neck and their muscles. Very rarely is it a disc or a herniation or something pressing on their nerves where we have to do something surgery. So fortunately, most neck problems we can treat non-operatively. Rick, you want to build on that in terms of neck pain when you see people in the office that aren't just responding to simple things? What, what, what is the problem for them? What, what structures are, are being inflamed? Well, that's a great question, Tom. The vast majority of the time, it's just simple arthritic changes and anti-inflammatory medicines, over-the-counter, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines and physical therapy, home exercise program, aerobic exercise, many times is all that is required for their symptoms to resolve. You know, Jeff, we did a survey of the public talking about what they want to know about, and the big question was in non-operative, was talking about massage and TENS units and chiropractic care and stuff. And so can you talk a little bit about what role those have in treating sure. neck problems? It's actually pretty common to get neck pain. You know, spinal disorders are pretty common, and most of the time it's pretty mild, and it resolves with conservative care. And that's why I think, you know, massage, acupuncture, things like that, soft tissue uh, treatments and physical therapy can really help alleviate a lot of the pain. And I think it's usually the first step. As long as there's nothing serious going on, that's usually the first step. We're sitting among giants at this table. I was just thinking, I want to thank you, Tom, and, and the society for bringing everyone together. Um, Ricky has taught me everything about arthroplasty. Jeff is one of the best public speakers I ever met, and Todd has been my brother throughout years. So I just want to thank you for bringing people together. So when it comes to the neck, it's interesting. I totally agree. Most people have neck pain. We say that 80% of the time we experience an episode of severe pain, and it usually is mild and it goes away. You only have to see a medical care provider after about six to eight weeks of neck pain, and we always get sort of a screening x-ray to make sure everything's okay. And we, we look for what they call red flags, things we have to worry about. Does this person have a potential fracture? Does he have osteoporosis with a compression deformity? Could it be something more serious like cancer? These are things we think about, but in the vast majority of time, it goes away on its own. Um, it's only when it persists and we have extremity pain and weakness do we ask experts to sort of chime in and, and give advice on treatment. What would you say people are always afraid to talk to a surgeon when they have a problem because they think all we want to do is cut? What, what, what's your answer to them about what's the frequency of people having surgery when they come in complaining of problems to a surgeon, to, to a competent spine surgeon? Sure. Among experts in the field, I would say that only 5% of people that see us actually need to have surgery. So the vast majority of time, and I say if you come from an area that doesn't have surgeons, and there's been studies shown where people had disabilities that required surgery, but there was no access to surgeons, people tend to get better over time. If you look at long-term studies, four years, eight years, 10 years, people will get better. What do surgeons provide? 
we provide an opportunity to get better a lot quicker. We turn to function a lot sooner. And if you have some sort of significant disability like loss of function, we can get you back. But the vast majority of the time, we're there to give advice to patients, and most people never require surgery. The field of spinal health care has evolved uh, epically over the past three decades. Uh, it's been a little longer track rate, but three decades. And I know that because that's been the lifetime of my career and, and my med school classmate, Dr. Sasso, um, we, we've lived through this transformation that's gone on. And, and the technology that's available today and what we're gonna talk about here are ways that we can surgically treat problems. Now, clearly, as according to what the Dr. Vaccaro just said, bulk of people are managed non-operatively and non-operative is essential. But we're also gonna get into say, if, if you have a problem that doesn't get better without surgery, how do you solve it and what technology is out today that can truly transform your life and get you back to function? So, you know, with that, Todd, what, what's the highlight of the technological evolution that you're excited about and, 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 and you want to showcase for the public? In surgery now, we have amazing ways to preserve motion. There's disc arthroplasty is spectacular, or it's come and, a long and what's, way. What's disc, disc arthroplasty? Disc arthroplasty is like you think of receiving a replacement knee or a replacement hip. It's a ball and socket is the easiest way to think about a hip joint. Um, the neck joint moves, and we didn't have ways in the past to keep it moving, keep the neck moving, and we now do. Not for everybody, but that's, it, that has advanced the way we can put a joint replacement in the neck. Um, and also, our techniques, some people do need to have a fusion. Our ways of doing fusion have improved as well. That's the welding together of uh, two vertebrae. An important way to look at disc replacement, since we're gonna talk about it a lot, is to understand that each level of the spine is a little bit like a tricycle. You got two little wheels in the back, which are called the facet joints, or a big wheel in the front, which is the disc, that allows the motion between the bodies. And, and what we're doing in disc arthroplasty is we're replacing the big wheel in the front, but it requires two healthy wheels in the back for it to work. So, so do you want to expand on that at all? I think disc arthroplasty, trying to preserve motion, is something that patients are very interested in. Uh, the important thing to understand is not everyone is a candidate for that. You know, I see a lot of patients that come in and they say, I've read a lot about this and I'm very interested in this procedure, uh, but we have certain criteria that make patients candidate and not candidates. And, and that's where you really need to talk to your surgeon. You don't want to come in with a preconceived notion of exactly what you want. Because what I tell my patients is that you know, every patient wants the smallest surgery possible. Every patient wants to preserve as much motion as possible. And they're not really unique in that aspect because that's what all the patients want. And that's really what we as surgeons want to do also. And so, uh, first of all, I would say don't be afraid to see a surgeon because most of the surgeons are just going to give you the advice and they're going to look towards conservative treatment first. Um, but to your point, if you replace the disc in the front, it can preserve motion. But the facet joints, which are the joints in the back of the neck, are still moving. And they can become arthritic as the disc becomes arthritic, so they can still be painful. And so one of the criteria for that may be a contraindication is if they have a lot of neck pain and a lot of facet arthritis, they have that per, per, uh, sort of disc arthroplasty to preserve motion, it could still have pain. And so that's one of the criteria that I think we all evaluate when we consider these patients for disc replacement. Or the arthritis can get worse because yeah. arthritis progresses with motion. Why would you do a disc replacement instead of a fusion, and can you combine them? If you do a disc replacement, that's called a single level motion sparing procedure. You can combine them with a fusion at one level. Say if you had a C5-6, that's just a level <clears throat> that's severely arthritic. You may want to fuse that, as Todd said, because it can cause pain with motion. The level above has a soft disc herniation where you just walk in, you move a disc off a nerve. That you may want to preserve. So studies have come out with hybrid procedures, fusion at one level, motion at another level, and the theory is it decreased junctional breakdown. If you look at the seminal papers published in the past, which is ironic, if you do a single level fusion, the chance of the next level breaking down and becoming symptomatic arthritic is higher than if you do a two level fusion for the level above it. So we, we consider these things and we look at long term studies. So we want to preserve motion because we don't want to transfer stresses. We don't really know if that's truly the case over 10 years. But that's a perfect example if you have two-level disease or three-level disease to do a stiffening procedure, which is a fusion, and then for arthritis, and then doing a motion sparing above. That would be the logic behind that choice. In the, in the big picture, though, uh, we can be very 
confident that both those operations work really, really well. Um, we do these operations mainly for nerve dysfunction. We call that radiculopathy, where a nerve, after it leaves the spinal cord, gets compressed as, it, as it's leaving its tunnel out of the cervical spine, out of the neck. And that operation, where we take the pressure off the nerve, restore the height, and either weld it together with a fusion or allow m motion, the outcomes of those operations now out to two decades, 20 years, is really, really good in, in both of those. And compared to, to traditionally what we think are great operations, like hip replacement and knee replacement, actually our, our operations in the neck are better. As, as people always look at a hip replacement as a gold standard, and, and they do make a big difference in lives, they improve lives. But we know from the, the outcome that the quality of improvement in a life is actually greater from spine surgery than it is from hip surgery. Not saying that hip surgery is bad, it's just saying how great modern spine surgery is. Exactly. So, you know, I, I did an interview uh, with some reporters when they were talking about whether or not that Las Vegas night needed a disc replacement or a fusion to go back to play. And, and the common question that came to me from the reporters, which stunned me a little bit, so I think we should talk to the public about, was, they said, if that hockey player has a fusion, then he won't be able to move his neck. How will he play? So do you want to explain to the public why a one-level fusion does not prevent them from moving their neck and, and the benefit of an arthroplasty? Thanks. That's, that's a great question. And I think uh, you have to step back and understand motion in the neck doesn't happen at one single point. Uh, as Todd said, there's seven different vertebrae in our spine. So each vertebrae is a hinge. As we get older, the natural history is we get more arthritic, and we all get a little stiffer. That's why when you look at your grandkid, his neck can move all motions and directions, but as you get older, your grandparents have a limited neck motion. So as we get older, our discs collapse a little bit, and Jeff sort of said it, all discs aren't equal, and all discs can't have an arthroplasty because we're fighting aging. And what we have to look at is, is how old is the spine, how much motion is preserved in the spine. So a hockey player tends to be a younger person, and you can do an arthroplasty in that population, but his grandfather or a 90-year-old, you probably wouldn't want to do an arthroplasty. So go back full swing to your question, is when you look at people, as we age, our range of motions decreases, but taking one level is the fuse one level is almost what happens to us as we age. And therefore, if you do a fusion at one level, your body accommodates for that. And you'll get a little bit more motion above or below it. So in essence, a fusion of the neck at one level doesn't stop your motion in the neck. It stops it at one segment, and you have all the other levels to absorb that. We did a study in Philadelphia looking at people who had two, three, and four level fusions. And we measured their motion really in this very critical way before and after their surgery. And every single patient in that study had more motion after surgery than before. Because people's motion is related to pain inhibition, to lots of things, not just the, they think of the mechanics of that one disc level, as Jim just Further, said. It amazes me when we do multi-level fusions, a cervical fusion, for example, a three to seven fusion, patients never come back to me and say, I lost range of motion. Because a great majority of your neck motion, C1, C2 is the top of your spine, which fortunately doesn't get as much arthritis as the rest of the spine. And so looking left and right is probably more of the motion we have. And we can accommodate using our chest and thoracic spine if other levels are immobilized. I know that in the uh, lumbar spine, thoracic spine, we're using robotics, we're using augmented reality, we're doing a lot. Um, do you want to comment, Alex, a little bit on, on the use of these technologies and their application to the neck, to treating the cervical spine? So it's interesting. On a weekly basis, um, Jim and I are at the same university now. We use the robot every week in the thoracolumbar spine, which is a chest. We haven't really used it that often in the neck. It's just being introduced. So I don't have that much personal experience in the cervical spine, and I'm not even aware if it's FDA approved in the cervical spine. I don't think it's approved yet by the government. I love the concept of having a robot assistant surgery because it removes fatigue from the surgeon, it removes tremor, it's more accurate. Jim is an expert in image guidance surgery. So Jim has a computer system in his operating room where he holds a device, he introduces the patient to the computer, they merge together so the computer knows exactly where the patient is in space, 
and he holds a tool, and it helps him guide where he places instruments. The robot <clears throat> actually holds the instrument, and then you are what they call the effector, and then you introduce the drill or the screw. I think it's a wonderful thing in complex anatomy. So as we deal with cervical deformity, and all of us deal with cervical deformity, sometimes relationships are so difficult to understand from a three-dimensional perspective. What is robot. deformity? The deformity is when you have a crooked neck. <clears throat> like, we look at each other, and we all have a somewhat of a good posture, and we have a nice little curve, and that curve is called the lordosis. Sometimes we have people with scoliosis. It bends the wrong way, kyphosis. It sublux. I mean, we have seen, collectively, all of us, we've all worked together in the past, <clears throat> some of the most complicated deformities we've ever seen, and a robot, an image guidance, may help us navigate to make that a safer procedure in the future. Today, the government hasn't approved it, but in the future, it will be approved. Because I, we've talked about technology, and I think we step back, and we're missing one point I think has evolved greatly. If you go back the last 50 years, we had x-rays. Patients came in, you got an x-ray. You didn't see that much. Next up came a CAT scan. A CAT scan, you see the bones a little bit better. Then came an MRI. And MRI and things such as spec scans or other areas are evolving rapidly. And so when you go to your doctor and you say, I have neck pain, and it's after six weeks, and they can't figure something out, it's, our tools are not as advanced yet to understand exactly where the pain's coming. But I think the future is going to be we're going to get better diagnostic tools. And so I just want to let the audience know that, you know, there is a bright spot out there, and I think we're getting better and better every year. And so technology and imaging is greatly advancing, and I think it's going to help us. In I think that's such a super important point. I really should have said, like, MRI and different tools that we use to see what the problem is has become, the, if we really think about the whole patient and, like, making the diagnosis, I think Jim's point's very important. Quality and the techniques that the scientists that use the MRI have advanced is amazing. And if you look at the research size of MRIs, we're now able to follow a neuron from your brain, down your spine, the track as it goes through the spinal cord, out your nerve, and down your arm, through the brachial plexus. And this is, it's, it's unbelievable where the radiology is advancing. But how are you applying it in surgery? You know, navigation is, like all things, uh, it was a little slow, slow to start for surgeons because you have to have a whole process to do it. And essentially, for the patients, you can think of it as your iPhone where you have a map. And so if you're going to someone's house, you have the map and you can drive to it. And it's, it, it helps you. It doesn't drive the car for you, although that's happening soon. And the robots are getting there. But it does give you a road map. And so as a surgeon, you can use that to help you in surgery and have your process move quicker, be more efficient, and safer for the patient. Everybody, the public knows what augmented reality is. You put those goggles on and you see a virtual landscape. So how does that apply to the spine? So uh, it's sort of the next step after navigation, uh, where you have a platform of, of, of an imaging study, a CT scan, uh, that we can see in three dimensions. And so we can see in three dimensions a virtual spine. And just like... Uh, well, not just a virtual spine, the patient's the, spine. The patient's <laughs> spine in a virtual right. reality. So we can have the spinal cord look, have a different color, look different than the bones where we're going to put our instrumentation, different than the nerves that are coming out, different than the vessels, different than the muscles. So we can see things in an augmented, so a better way, a better fashion. Right, and I, I would agree. I think navigation is a fantastic tool. I think it makes the surgery safer for the patients. It gives the surgeon more confidence. And especially with training programs, a lot of us are training residents and fellows. It lets, allows them to see the anatomy. So I do think it results in safer surgery. I think augmented reality is something that's a great educational tool. Um, a lot of times, people in training, they can practice the surgery through virtual reality and augmented reality. I think it gives the surgeon and the assistants uh, a better education because as the surgeon is doing the surgery, the assistants and the people in the room can see things three-dimensionally and see what the surgeon's viewing. Because a lot of times, if traditionally, I'm looking through my heart, my assistant is looking through a different viewpoint, we can all sort of look at the same viewpoint. So I think that's very exciting. But I think in education, I think that's going to be one of the biggest advances. It's truly a phenomenal world that we're evolving in. And we're helping people because of technology, because of knowledge, because of experts like these. So I want to run down and get one word from each of you describing what you think of spinal health care in 2022. So if you can give me your one word to summarize it. My word would be innovative. 
My word would be exciting. There's a lot coming down. Return back to function. Function. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Progressing. We've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. And I was going to say all those, but I'll use evolving. <laughs> well, so I want to give our, our experts a chance to share with you some wisdom. And so we'll start with you, Jim, and we're going to start to share words of advice for all of our patients about spinal health care. If you happen to be along the road, nothing else worked, and you're finally down to that surgical decision, I would recommend you get a second opinion. And one thing we haven't talked about, which I think is super important, we've learned a lot about, is spinal cord dysfunction, we call myelopathy. And the problem with spinal cord dysfunction is it's not painful. And so uh, many times patients start losing function in their hands, numbness and tingling, difficulty doing fine motor activities, buttoning buttons. And patients may not think that that's a problem coming from their neck. And if you start having these problems, difficulty gait, a little unsteady in their gait, um, you need to see a spine surgeon. I don't want people to worry about if you get to the point where you're not getting better, don't be afraid of seeing a surgeon. People think, oh my goodness, the operating room, something bad's going to happen to me. I make it hurt. I make it paralyzed. Things have evolved to the point now where I say sometimes surgery is safer than non-operative care. As Rick just said, cervical myelopathy. 68 to 75 percent of those patients that start getting numbness in their hands, losing fine finger dexterity, losing the ability to ambulate, they will get paralyzed eventually, and surgery is a safer solution. So with today's modern medicine, it's so much safer to proceed to surgery if necessary. Because I see so many patients that come in, and they've talked to some of the great healthcare providers that we've seen, physical therapists, their internal medicine doctor, they've talked to their neighbor, they're a little afraid to see a surgeon because they, they, they fear that a surgeon is just only going to talk about surgery. And they come in with a bit of misinformation, not, not anything intentional, but they just don't understand some of the intricacies of the spine. The other thing that I think was alluded to earlier is that we're dealing with the spinal cord. So we talked about most of the conditions are not going to need surgery, but there are some conditions that can be pretty serious, and, and those would be potentially dangerous not to do surgery. And so the best information I think you can get is to see a surgeon. Don't be afraid to see a surgeon. You'll get the real information. I would just emphasize what Jeff just said. There's almost no surgeon. I can't imagine a person with the oath we take. We're in it with the patient. We, we're a team, and we only want them to get better. So why in the world would we want to do something with our knowledge that we think is going to either make them worse or put them on a path where they need more and more and more. So I would just emphasize, you should be comfortable to go to a surgeon, and there are certain things that I won't say they're silent killers, but they're silent disablers. And Rick really nicely spoke about spinal cord compression. And if you have those symptoms, you should see a, uh, a surgeon or someone very expert in making that diagnosis. With today's technology, with today's knowledge, getting the right treatment is essential for people. And, and waiting too long can lead to bigger problems than getting the best and innovative treatment today. So when you see great surgeons, they don't wanna operate unless they know they're gonna make you better. And with the technology today, they can make you better when you have the right problem. And so get that evaluation, see the experts, and know that you can get back to your life, you can have your life improved and restored so you can be part of your family and society. And I would like to say that having been a patient, it is very scary to go see a spine surgeon. But one of the things that we are doing at the National Spine Health Foundation is bringing the surgeons to you, bringing the experts to you. And I cannot express my deepest gratitude to this group of humanitarians. They're not just surgeons, they're not just doctors, they're humanitarians and they're people. And um, if you think about seeing a surgeon who you connect with and you trust, that, that is the most important thing in, in identifying and selecting a surgeon. I think it's been said today to get a second opinion because it is a relationship and that relationship is something that you have to trust. And don't be afraid to see a spine surgeon, but also get informed. And at the National Spine Health Foundation, we provide incredible resources so that you can understand a little bit more about what's going on with you and that you can have a conversation with an expert to help identify the right treatment for you. So I want to thank everybody for being here and for their contributions to what we are doing.